Hi. So let me ask you, have you ever experienced this? You're going about your day and the phone rings and you look down and you see it's that one person you really don't want to talk to because you know they're going to want you to do something. And it may be your friend, it may be your family member. For me, it was my boss. So I, I look down and apprehensively I, I pick up the phone and sure enough, that big project I'm working on, he's moving the due date up a week. My stomach drops. Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I was barely making that original deadline. How am I going to do this? And, and I'm starting to feel a little panicky and, and the overwhelm and the hopelessness and, and I kind of want to scream. Ever feel like that? Yeah? That's us going into everyday survival mode. Now, I know when most of us, we think about survival mode, we're thinking about that proverbial tiger that comes after us and we go into that fight or flight. Well, there's times when we know we're doing that. Like when you're driving down the road and you glance down just for a moment and you look up and there's the red taillights right in your face. You've got to slam the brakes and veer off to the right of the road and, and your heartbeat's racing and your, your, your blood is just coursing with adrenaline so you feel that tingliness. And, and now you know you're safe so you take that deep breath and you shake it off. Then you know you're in survival mode. But on that phone call, we don't even realize we're going into survival mode. And we have so many of those events going out through the day that it just kind of seems the way the course goes up for life. We get so accustomed to it. And we just long for those moments when, you know, you're in that flow, when things are really clicking and, and you're having a good time and you're enjoying what you're doing. You know those times when you're, you're working, you started at 8 and you were so productive, you think it must be noon, but it's only 9.30? Or the opposite, where you've been having so much fun, you think it's only been 30 minutes and it's three hours, but you're still energized. That's when we're thriving. But those moments are kind of fleeting, aren't they? Because it goes more like this. See if this sounds familiar. All right, so I'm on the phone with my boss, right? I'm, I'm feeling that anxiety, that hopelessness. I, I'm wanting to scream. I'm going into fight or flight, but it's my boss. I'm not going to attack him, so I go silent. I don't say much. And when I get off the phone, I can't shake it off because now I'm worried. I'm worried. What is this going to mean about my job performance? What's this going to mean about my, job, uh, my career? Uh, and he's really being unreasonable. He's totally being unfair. I'm getting angry now. And I don't know about you, but when I'm in that mode, you know what I want to do next? I want to go tell somebody. I want to tell somebody what awful thing just happened. Don't you? Yeah, and what I find is I typically get one of three responses. The first one, oh my gosh, that is awful. You don't need to take that. You need to go in there. You need to give them a piece of your mind. Second response, oh my gosh, you poor thing. That, that's just terrible. You don't need to take that. You need to leave. You need to go get another job. Both fight or flight. And now I'm, I'm sure that I'm in danger. It's just been reinforced. But then there's that third response. You know, the person that's trying to give you suggestions on what you can do to solve the problem. You know, that's when I want to say, but you don't understand. You don't understand what I'm dealing with or who I'm dealing with. Uh, you know, you don't know my boss. Because when we're in fight or flight mode and survival mode, we're not looking for solutions. I already know what's going on. I already know what needs to be done. I'm not looking for solutions. I'm looking for agreement. Because I've got to find my allies because if there's a danger out there, there's an enemy. There's that tiger that we need to go track down and kill, right? And that tiger, it's, it's whatever had me feel that threat. So for me, it was a boss. For other people, it's time. Other people, it's that teenager that won't cooperate. We all have our tigers, don't we? Can you think of yours? Yeah, more than one. Yeah, and you know, that tiger, we need to go get it. And you're either with me or you're against me, even if you're trying to give me a solution. Now we're right. With all this agreement, we're right, that we're, we're right that there's something wrong and it's their fault. And this is where I think we get stuck. This is where we get kind of addicted to survival mode because I'm now fighting the good fight. I'm fighting for my job. I'm fighting for success. And I'm now, even though I'm feeling frustrated and angry and upset, feeling a little bit justified and righteous. 
don't we? Now, my primary objective, you know what it's going to be? Finding that proof and evidence of how wrong that tiger is. It's like tracking it down so that I can trap it. Right? But you know what? I found out that I'm the one being trapped. Because with all that energy and, and, and action of try, trying to track down the tiger and trap it, I've not put any focus on that project that I need to be successful in. We're in survival mode. And this is the kicker when we're in survival mode, is that what we're really afraid of, what's at the heart of the danger, because it's not life or death. It's not even a tiger. It's our belief that we can't have what we want and we're afraid it's true. So I can go out and trap that tiger and even get my boss in trouble, but guess what I get? I get to be right that I can't have what I want. And even if I leave, same thing. Yeah, I get rid of my boss, but I keep the belief. There will always be another tiger. I'll find it. That's survival mode. Well, then there's that other mode, you know, the thriving, you know, where you're having fun, where you're actually enjoying life. How many of you like to play games? I'm a big game player. You should see my iPhone. <laughs> I love figuring out how to get the highest score. I mean, that feels good, doesn't it? And what I realized was when I'm in thriving mode, when I'm focused on a project that I'm really enjoying, I have the same mindset that I do when I'm playing my favorite game. Think about it. When you're playing a game, it's about there's a, that goal, the object of the goal, um, of the game. There's that goal. And you opt in. And when you opt in, that goal becomes your primary objective. And there's obstacles in every game. That's what makes the game a game. Think about it. When you're playing tennis, it's about hitting a ball of a certain size over a net and getting in bounds longer, keeping it in bounds longer than the other person. All unnecessary, but that's what makes the game a game. And that's how you know what skills you need and, and how you, what you need to learn. It's the same when I'm playing and, and thriving in with that project. If I'm working on putting together a workshop and I'm enjoying it, there's going to be obstacles that happen. You know, the, the printing's not done on time or the room's set up wrong. But when I'm thriving, it's not a threat. It's, it's an obstacle. So it's, I might go, oh, like you do when you miss a shot. But I'm right back looking for that solution of what can I do to make this a successful project. And often in games, you play an opponent, right? Now, you don't want to play someone you're going to beat every time, do you? Well, most of us don't, right? <laughs> it gets boring, doesn't it? We want to play somebody who's going to give us a challenge, who, who's going to have us stretch the way we look at our game and, and have us grow. It's the same when I'm thriving. I don't want, I mean, I may have somebody that's going to not agree with me or want something different, but they're not the tiger that I need to track down. There's somebody that has a different point of view, somebody that is gonna, going to have me stretch my thinking. And even if I don't agree with them, I, I can respect the role that they're playing. And we all like to know what the score is in a game, don't we? Because it lets us know how we're doing. And if the score is not what we want it, we know that it means we need to adjust our game or up our skill. It's the same when I'm thriving. I relish the feedback. I want to know how I'm doing. And if something is going wrong or off track, it's not a threat or proof that I can't have what I want. It's information that lets me know that I need to adjust what I do next time in order to be successful. And yeah, we have fun when we reach the goal. But we also, when we're thriving, don't you have fun getting there in the whole process? It's when we're engaged in life, when we're feeling good and creative, we get to shine. Now, I find that I'm either in thriving or surviving at any moment. Most of us are. And a lot of times it's about the situation and we're toggling back and forth, we forgot that we have control over what side we're in. Now, what I want to know is, where do you think most people spend the majority of their time? Survival. Yeah, and it's no surprise because there's a lot of agreement that that's real life. You know, we're so accustomed to that being in that mode that it's, it's life, deal. Now, where do you want to spend most of your time? Thriving. Me. I do too. 
So what I decided was that I've got to make that choice. And, and, and I created for myself a game, a mindful game of thriving instead of increasing the time I spent in thriving and decreasing the time I spent in survival mode. Because there'll always be survival mode, but we don't have to spend all that time there. And what I found was there was five uh, different strategies that I could use to go from survival mode back to thriving. The first is I need to be aware. I need to know which mode I'm in. If I know I'm thriving, I'm feeling good. I'm, I'm engaged. And if I'm aware of it, I can consciously have fun. But if I'm in survival, when I'm feeling that negative feeling, when I'm feeling stressed, I know that I'm survival mode. I also know that I have a choice. I don't need to stay there. I can look at what do I need to refocus on. If I am not aware of it, I'm stuck. But the moment I know, I have a choice. And that brings to the second strategy. The second one is to know what I want to have a goal that I can opt into and have that be my pri primary objective instead of trying to chase down the tiger. In my job, what I did was I had my goal be about making a difference. You know what? I could opt into that, no matter what else was going on. Now, the third strategy is being very conscious of the next action that I take and making sure that it's action that's going to take me towards my goal instead of looking for agreement or finding proof and evidence. So that conscious action towards my goal. Now, the fourth strategy is about facts and data. I don't know, but you, when I'm in survival mode, I know I have tunnel vision. I'm just looking. It's like when you're tracking a tiger, you're, you're only looking at the ground. You're not seeing the big picture. So I know that when I'm in survival mode, I want to take a deep breath, step back, and get more information. Ask questions. Get clarity. Look at what are the more options that I have besides just the flight or fl uh, fight or flight. And then the fourth and most powerful is cultivating the emotion of appreciation. Appreciating the situation, appreciating the people that I'm playing with, and appreciating myself. Now I mean the emotion of appreciation, not just knowing I need to appreciate my boss, I need to appreciate my job. Really feeling that emotion. One of the things that I did was practice that with my boss because I had to practice because at first it was hard, but I got to the point where I really could appreciate him as a human being. And what I found is that I had a totally different conversation with him. I could ask for clarity. I could actually state my point of view instead of just going silent. And it changed the whole dynamic of the relationship and how I was in that job. And it, uh, it allowed me to thrive more than survive, no matter how weird the job got. But where I really tested my, my skill at thriving beyond survival with, was with my dad. See, my dad had d dementia, and a type of dementia where he could not speak clearly, and his health was on decline. He was dying. How many of you deal with something like that? Yeah. You talk about being thrown in survival mode. I didn't want my dad to die. I didn't want him to have that disease. But I didn't want to be miserable in the last day of his, days of his life. So I decided if even in this situation, I wanted to thrive. And so I became, once I became aware of my, uh, that I was in survival, I knew that I needed to find a goal. What is a goal that I could opt into? And that goal became consciously spending, making sure that each moment I spent with my dad was special. And then I kicked in on the appreciation because I needed to appreciate the situation. It is part of life. It's the game board that we're on. But I also was appreciating my dad for who he was then. Instead of being sad about who he used to be and how he wasn't that anymore, I started appreciating who he was now. And that allowed me to be able to look at all the facts and all the data about the medical, his medical um, needs and help my mom and my family make better decisions because the facts were no longer a threat. And then of course, it was about the whole action, every moment I spent with him. I mean, there's this one time when my mom called up because my dad was upset because there's somewhere he needed to go and he was late. You know how they get? 
I mean, he needed to go. And so he kept leaving the house. My mom would get him back in, but he kept leaving the house and my mom would get back in and she was exhausted. So she called me up and asked for some relief. I went and picked him up to drive him around because sometimes that would calm him down. This time, he wasn't having anything to do with it. Every time I got to a stop sign, he tried to get out of the car. I had to keep hitting the lock buttons. But because I was playing my mindful game, I wasn't upset that he was upset. I wasn't even frustrated that my mom couldn't handle it. I was looking at what's the next opportunity. And so I ended up taking him to my house. And when I walked in, I had, a, I had an idea pop in my head because I saw my iPod in the player. And I know my dad likes music, so I went over there and I pushed play, not caring what song came on, and just started swaying to the music. At first, my dad was standing there glaring at me, but I didn't care because I just danced. And after a moment, he started tapping his foot. He started swaying. We ended up dancing for the next 20 minutes. And that became one of the most special times I ever had with my dad before he died. And it would not have been possible if I hadn't been playing a mindful game of thriving. Now, we all, I always fall into survival mode. It happens. But now, instead of being my norm, it's just an obstacle in my mindful game. So my question to you, you want to play too? Come on, join me. Thank you.